awkward silence has fallen over here. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Amanda Carling. I'm the manager of the New Women's Initiative, and I'm a graduate of this fine institution. Welcome. Have a sandwich. Um, I have recently returned from my maternity leave, so not only is this the first uh, speaker series of the year, it is also um, my debut. <laughs> No, I'm back and I'm so glad to be back and for the students who are new or maybe saw me at the beginning of last year but didn't get a chance to uh, engage in the programming that happened last year, uh, please come and visit me. My office is beside Sarah Marnie's and across from the SLS office, so um, that's, that's enough about me. Let's talk about the land. Um, <laughs> this university is really privileged and lucky to operate on territory that has been um, taken care of by many different groups over at least 15,000 years that we know of, um, and that includes Haudenosaunee peoples and Anishinaabe peoples and the people who we um, recognize now are the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and we're really grateful at this university to have a relationship um, with that community and with their leadership. I had a call with Chief LaForme yesterday, and he never ceases make me laugh um, and it, um, acknowledging the land is really important but not important if it isn't meaningful and if it isn't reflective of um, meaning something to us personally and individually and not just about like okay here's a housekeeping matter and now we've done this so um, I am a Métis person my ancestors were the Red River Métis and I came here for law school about 10 years ago I've been a guest on this territory for about 10 years and it is very much my home, but I am very much a guest, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here um, every day and to get to share the little bit I know with you and learn lots from the people in this room. The next person I'm going to talk to is also a guest, although he's been, I think, in Toronto just as long as me or longer. Seven years? <laughs> um, so Zach Beach is an earthling student at a firm called Wolfius Clear Townshend, LLP, who you might be familiar with. He is also a recent alumni of this fine institution. He graduated in June and uh, he's doing his articles right now. He's Plains Creek from Alberta and grew up in Cochrane. He did his undergrad here at the University of Toronto with a major in public policy and governance and minors in Aboriginal studies and the Russian language. Just in case. Uh, during these years, Zach began to connect with Toronto's diverse Indigenous community, learned as much about his own culture and heritage as well. Um, as a result, he started learning how to channel his passion for supporting Indigenous peoples, cultures, languages, and life ways, and came to see law as a great source of influence on Indigenous issues. So, a natural fit was a JD at the University of Toronto, um, and he had the opportunity of working with our guest of honor today, um, Jonathan Rudin, when he was a Colwood Fellow. So he's going to talk to you a little bit about his Colwood Fellowship, but for the law students in the room who aren't sure what they're going to do this summer, um, fellowship opportunities like that that he um, had with Aboriginal Legal Services, but specifically working with Jonathan Rudin on this wonderful book, um, is he's going to talk to you about that. Um, Zach was the co-founder of the Indigenous <coughs> Studies Students Union as an undergraduate student. He also co-founded the Indigenous Rights Working Group at the Asper Center for Constitutional Rights um, during his time in law school. He was <coughs> a member of the Indigenous Law Students Association. He won awards for all of his contributions to the law school. Um, he's also an uh, amazing guitar player, and when the Indigenous Students Office door is beside mine and they are playing music, I get the um, I get the accompaniment of live music makes your work really even better than it already is. Um, so I'm going to give it over to Zach, who is going to introduce Jonathan, but just on one final note, um, I'm really grateful to have Jonathan here because he is not only a wonderful speaker and a really important person in the field of um, trying to make the Canadian colonial law a little bit less terrible for Indigenous people. Um, he is also a close friend and mentor, and uh, I invited him fairly last minute and he made time in his busy schedule for us so thank you from me and now Zach. Thank you. okay hi everybody uh, so yeah I'm Zach uh, and I am a recent alumni I'm so recent that uh, the library just cut off my privileges as a person this month um, so 
Uh, yeah, I had the honor and privilege of working with Jonathan uh, my first year summer. Um, and so I have this list of stuff about Jonathan because um, he's done a lot. Um, I can't get the list of crap at all. Um, so uh, Jonathan received his LLB and LLM from Oswald Hall. Uh, and in 1990, he was hired to establish Aboriginal Legal Services uh, and has been with ALS ever since. Uh, currently, he is the program director. Uh, Jonathan has appeared before all levels of court, uh, including the Supreme Court uh, in a number of cases, including the landmark IT decision. Um, at ALS, he helped establish the Community Council, uh, the first urban Aboriginal justice program. Uh, this was back in 1992. And uh, in 2001, he helped establish the Gilladu Aboriginal Persons Court at uh, the old city. Jonathan has written and spoken widely on issues of coverage and justice. Um, this book is only just one example. He's got articles out, he's done lots of speaking and whatnot. Um, but, but this book uh, was released just last year to my father as a book. And uh, Jonathan also teaches uh, on a part time basis at the Department of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. <laughs> uh, last but not least, he plays the mandolin and sings with Gordon's acoustic living room, an awesome freaking band, you should check it out. Um, they're a lot of fun, uh, they have YouTube videos. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on uh, my Hollywood uh, experience with him uh, as well. Um, so, my first summer uh, uh, of, of law school, Signed up on the Colwood Fellowship, which is exclusive for Indigenous students. Um, and one of the requirements is you have to work either with a First Nation or uh, uh, an Indigenous organization working on Indigenous issues. Essentially, um, ALS ticks that box perfect match. Um, and so Jonathan uh, was contacted uh, by the Demon Publishers, and he was getting ready to put together the book and he needed a research assistant. So that was, that was my job for the summer. Um, and it was, in, instead of just sitting around, you know, reading stuff and, and you know, doing citations and stuff, it was, it was quite a bit more than that, I found. Um, because as we made our way through sort of you know, constructing the book and, and figuring out what was working, what, what wouldn't work, what wasn't available or whatever, um, uh, it, it was kind of a really interesting organic process. And, and, the end product, like it was just really, really fantastic um, to see it all come together. Um, I also had the opportunity to go down to the, the Gladue Court um, at Old City Hall a couple of times. I got to sit in on uh, some sentencing circle uh, related proceedings there, and that was really interesting to sort of see um, alternative frameworks at play for real people, real indigenous people. The justice system um, and seeing the judges, uh, the, the non indigenous judges, starting to wrestle with and try and you know, take on board this alternate way of thinking, which just kind of goes against the way that they would typically do things, like completely against the way they typically do things, um, to the point where they couldn't figure out whether or not they should be bringing robes or not to the, the events. One, one of the judges came without robes, and one of the judges came with robes. Um, I also got to go down to uh, the uh, Aboriginal Youth Court, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, so I got to spend some time uh, watching a similar proceeding there uh, where they brought in a young guy, he was a, a young First Nations guy, um, like, like high school age, and he, he was brought in to change. Um, and it, it was just a minor little discussion about scheduling. Seeing the judge try and sort of take on board and learn a little bit about you know, some of the ceremonial aspects that could be meaningful, like opening with a smudge prayer and that sort of thing. Um, it, it was interesting to see that sort of growth happening in real time. Um, so, as a research assistant, I really got a really interesting experience that was, um, like I say, it was more 
than just reading or writing and research. That being said, the amount of uh, work that it took to put this together and to find everything that we needed um, was really, really, really uh, a game changer for me. I found it in my later law school years and now at OKT, uh, the research skills and the sort of flexibility and the tricks that you can learn to, to find tricky stuff and to be really comfortable with you know, the legal citation, the legal guide, and all that sort of stuff. That, that, those skills um, really, really <coughs> to be an itch moving forward to the point where now in my work, like, you know, I was actually just at the libraries today grabbing some books and, you know, there's a little bit of a thrift that you can, you can apply to, to find some difficult stuff. So that was the kind of experience that I had to work with John. Um, and it was, it was just fantastic. Um, you know, really pouring all of his knowledge, years and years and years of experience into this uh, book. And just you know, be able to write all the chapter. Just, oh, there we go. Look at that. And that's how it goes. And find me the source and find that one. Um, it, was, it was something else. I, I had never seen anything like it. Catapult me and uh, my direction of life as well. So, um, yeah, uh, I guess without further ado, man of the hour, John Drew. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, uh, thanks Amanda. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, just so you have a sense of how this is supposed to go, Amanda told me. So I'm going to talk, and then you're going to ask questions. I'm going to talk for about an hour. I can talk longer, but I'm going to talk for about an hour. But I might stop earlier, ask questions, whatever. That'd be great. So it's very nice to be here at U of T. I usually mention this when I'm here. As Zach mentioned, that I, I got my law degree at, at the other law school. Here, I, I did apply to U of T. Um, I remember the rejection letter. Something, it went something like this, I'm paraphrasing. I think it went, dear undergraduate scum, <laughs> we have incredibly high standards here. You failed to meet them. Good luck with your pathetic life. I think, <laughs> or words to that effect. That's, that's what I recall that it said, but I, I may have blocked out some of the negative parts. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I went to I went to to school at Osgood, and and I just want to talk a little bit about this because I'm not really interested in talk like I don't really want to talk about my life. I want to talk about some of the things that I've experienced. But I, so when I went to law school, I um, it was it was okay. I mean, it was interesting. Um, but by the time it finished, I thought I don't want to be a lawyer. It's just not what I want to be. And that, that's a personal decision. Now, it's not a value judgment and people will do what they want to do. It was not for me what I wanted to do. I, was, I wanted to be involved in working to social change. I thought law would be a place to do it. And then after law school, I, I was not as convinced that that would happen. Um, I did article and get called to the bar because I figured I might as well have a skill to fall back on. Um, and I worked the next uh, 10 or 11 years doing various work for community organizations. And I mention this because um, in, you, now you may not know this just, but I, I am a bit older. So, um, so in 1981, I was uh, working, organizing a conference uh, the first international conference on prison abolition. It's a series of conferences that con continued. It's uh, over, over around the world. It's held every two years. And it was an incredibly significant event for me for two reasons, really. One, because I met my wife, Barbara, there, because she was working on the conference, too, which is just a beautiful romantic story. How did you meet? Well, there's still prisons, but we're together. So <laughs> it wasn't a complete success. but. But the other thing that was, was, was incredibly significant is I met a man named Art Solomon. And Art is an Ojibwe elder, was an Ojibwe elder. And 
when I met Art, I listened to him and I realized that Art was, and just confirmed over the years that I knew him, Art was like one of the wisest people I've ever met. And one of the things that listening to Art showed me in a way that I don't think I really knew before was that there's this huge difference between being smart and being wise. You guys are all smart. You can't get to law school without being smart. You're all smart, and that's good. But that doesn't mean that you actually know a whole lot or that you have any wisdom. And this is an important thing that I'm going to come back to because one of the difficulties with law is that we think after we finish law school that we're something special and we know things. And we do know some things, some things but we're not that special. And what we have to do is understand that there are people who know a whole lot more than we do. And they don't always look like they know a whole lot more than we do because depending how you value um, or how you rate people's skills or whatever, Art didn't have a, a degree from any university. He got a couple honorary degrees later. He didn't have any degrees. I don't think he finished high school. He worked. But he knew stuff. He was wise. And that was really important to me. I learned something beyond just always wanting to be wherever art was. I learned that was an important thing that I learned. And so over the, the, um, the 80s, great decade, <laughs> well, lots of great music. Can't think of anything offhand. Um, but uh, I worked on a variety of projects. And near the end, I, I met up with Art again because I was organizing a conference on First Nations justice. And I had an opportunity actually at that point as I was doing that. It was an interesting time because I was doing my master's, uh, my LLM, you know, I was going on a part-time basis. And I was also meeting, had an opportunity to talk to elders, like not just Art. And I was reading as part of my LLM, I'm reading um, John Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau and, you know, why do we have a duty to obey the state and all of these notions of, you know, the individual, what's in our self-interest. And, and, and I'm also talking to elders. And I realized the stuff that I'm learning or list reading again, because I've done some undergraduate work on this, stuff I'm reading through my LM course, like, I can't even begin to describe this to the elders. Like this is such a completely different way of seeing the world. It's not a better or best, just a completely different way of seeing the world. And that reminded me again that we, we take for granted the ways we see the world. And we often think the way we see the world is the way the world is. And it's a construction. And that's okay. But we have to be aware that there are other constructions. And Again, not wishing to put down the degree that you are spending a ridiculous amount of money to get, and it's not your fault. That's a whole different issue. Um, and I should say, and I, I do want you know, that, and because uh, I always have to say this when I'm in a law school, just because eventually I will stop being asked back. I do find the tuitions that people have to pay is ridiculous, and I, and I think the problem with it is that it makes some of the decisions that I made harder. When I decided I didn't want to practice law, I could do that because I was not burdened with debt. And I could work at organizations and not expect, because why would I expect to be paid as a lawyer? Because I was not being a lawyer. So I had that opportunity. And I do think that's, that is a legitimate challenge that all of you are going to face. And I don't mean to diminish it at all. It's more than real. But, but you know, there's... One of the things that we, we don't always understand when we go through law school, that there are different ways of seeing the world, because we, we're taught that law is the way to see the world. We start to see the world through a legal lens. You know, and you know, think about, if you can, before you went to law school. You, know, you think of issues now differently that you are in law school than you used to. And that's OK. But it doesn't make the way you think about them now right. It just makes them different. That's sort of the conditioning you get from law school. Law school is, my theory, 
is three years long, not because it takes you that long to learn the necessary skills, because you'll get those pretty quick. It's because it takes about three years to mold people so they start to see the world in what is an increasingly a narrower and narrower and narrower way. And by the time you finish law school, and you will fight it, I'm sure, and that's good, but by the time you finish law school, your vision of the world gets really narrowed. And that's, again, not a bad thing. I mean, it's what it is. But what happens is, if you forget that you have a narrow vision of the world and pretend that's actually the world, that's a problem. And so one of the things that working with the elders at this conference helped me realize again, because I need that, I needed that, I still need that, that I need to realize that the way we construct the world is not the way the world is. So uh, the conference finished, and then, as Zach mentioned, I got hired at Aboriginal Legal Services. There was a job posting. It was a one-month posting for a job at Aboriginal Legal Services, and I have been there ever since. I am so looking forward to my vacation because it's the longest freaking month I've ever had. Um, and, you know, there have been all sorts of great experiences I've had, but I, I want to talk about a few because I think it builds on some of the things that I was saying. For me, I mean, so for example, we started, Aboriginal Legal Service started, and we, one of the first things we did we did a grant proposal to a ministry of the attorney general to set up, as, as Zach said, the community council, the first urban indigenous justice program in Canada. And we did a grant proposal and we got the money and we had no idea what we were doing. Like we did, we had no idea because no one had done this. There weren't programs in urban areas. We didn't know, but I didn't, I wasn't worried because I didn't feel I had to know it all. It wasn't my, I mean, why would I? I mean, I mean, I'm the wrong person to put this together, but I have resources, and the resources obviously I have are the elders and traditional teachers in the community, because they know things. Because, you know, there's been justice in this, wherever there are people, there are systems of justice. There have been systems of justice here for thousands and thousands of years. It's not like, it's not like indigenous people were waiting for the British to come up. Oh, thank God. I didn't know what we were going to do. We have these wigs and no one knows what to do with them. We don't know who to wear them and who, you know, we don't know what to do. You know, that's not how it works. People have, have always known how to maintain social control. They've always known. And so for us, and, and I just want to talk about that for a second. And this speaks again to the, the, the issue of, of what we learn. One of the things that we learn in first year criminal, I can, uh, <laughs> is this idea of guilt, right? Guilty. Guilty is an incredibly complicated term. We use the word guilty. What does that mean? Like you try and describe what guilty means without using the word guilty. It's really hard. It's really hard. It doesn't mean taking responsibility because that's too broad. It isn't, you know, that you feel bad about it because that's too broad. I mean, guilty means having the mens rea and the actus reus. It means wanting to do, deciding you're going to do something that you know is wrong or ought to know is wrong or are reckless as to whether or not it's wrong. And, and at the time that you're thinking about it, that you actually do the thing. Try explaining that to someone, right? You don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. We're lawyers. And that short forms it all. When we're in court, if you're doing criminal law, it's all short form. Guilty, not guilty, mens rea, actus rea. No one else knows what the heck we're talking about, right? Well, so think about when you're trying to explain that to people who, you know, think about people who speak a different language, who don't have the word guilty in their language, because most indigenous people don't have guilty in their language. Think about how you have to translate that. That's, that's really, really hard. So we, we, we got this funding. We're going to set up this 
indigenous justice program. And again, I'm not going to set up an indigenous justice program because I am the wrong person to do that for every possible reason. So, but I'm not worried, as I said, because we have elders and traditional teachers we can rely on. And, and, I'm, I, and, and I can recall the things that we did around setting this up, and I'm going back now to 1991. And I remember these events because they were so significant. As Zach said, I've been lucky enough, I've been in court a bunch, I've been in Supreme Court a bunch of times, other courts, that's fun, but I don't remember those experiences as much as I remember these experiences, because these, these were meaningful, and this is where I really learned stuff. So, first time we got a meeting at the Native Canadian Center, we had about 20 or 30 elders, and I went in and said, so we're thinking about setting this thing up, what do you think, should we do it? Because if you're going to start to do things, you have to, when you start asking people, you have to start by asking people whether you should do it. You should never assume that, that you're the right people to do it. Maybe you're not. And when you ask people, you have to be up front. If you don't care what they say, don't ask them. When we went to the elders, we said, should we do this? And if you tell us we shouldn't do it, then we won't. Like, don't have these pretend things, should we do it, but we're doing it anyway. If you're going to do that, then be up front. Anyway, they said, yeah, you should do it. And I said, I have a bunch of questions. And they went, OK, we can't answer them here. We're going to ask someone to set up uh, a meeting for you, and you'll have a few days to ask the questions. And they asked someone um, to be responsible to set it up. And I learned so much from this process. Um, so the guy they asked uh, lived up at Cape Croker. and um, this was like in June that we met. And we have this money. I have this grant from the funding from the Ministry of Attorney General. Of course, they want things, right? They want me to report and they want to know what. So I start calling this guy uh, saying, hey, uh, when's it happening? And he'd say, you know, it'll happen when it happens. And this is not the answer I want. Um, so I keep calling. And eventually, he just stops answering the phone completely. And then I would call, I'd leave a message, would he call me? And he never calls me back because he knows what I want. And he, it's his job is more important. He was not asked by me to do this. He was asked by the elders and traditional teachers to set something up. So that set up a responsibility he had to do things in the right way. Not the way I wanted it done, but the right way. And so for him, and for many, again, not every, but for many indigenous peoples when this is happening, that means the right people in the right place at the right time. That's when it's going to happen. That's a lot of work, because you have to find the right people, and you have to find the right place, and you have to have the, find the right time. And I am no help in this, right, because I just keep bothering him. So, it's August now. <laughs> like, he's not calling me. What am I going to do? It's August, and I get a phone call I, on a Monday or Tuesday. I can't remember what. And he says, OK, it's happening. Let's say the call happened on Monday. It's happening. Be up at uh, Birch Island in Manitoulin Island on Wednesday. We're starting on Wednesday. Go over to so-and-so's house because they have a key to the house where the people are staying. You bring a tent, because you're not staying in the house. That's for the elders and the teachers. Get some food. He didn't ask me. He told me. Because he'd done the work. He'd found the people. He'd found the place, and this was the time. I'd asked for this to happen, so I had to be ready. And I was ready, because I had to be ready. So I went, and I spent two and a half days. Well, we had to get up there, but like two and a half days. And it was, again, it was, it was an incredible experience. I, I asked a whole bunch of questions. People were incredibly patient. We spent like the first day, first day, I said, so we're setting up this program. It's going to be a criminal diversion program. We're taking people out of the criminal justice system. Um, you know, what should we look for for the people who are going to sit on this thing that we're setting up? And it took me, it took me the morning. People were incredibly, we, we were outside. We had a sacred fire. 
people were speaking in their language, some people could be translated. It took me forever to learn this. Now I can tell you, but it took me forever to learn this. I said, well, what you want to do is you want to find people who can treat you know, victims and offenders with kindness and respect. That was really hard for me to hear because, well, because I'm kind of thick, but because when you start thinking about setting up a justice system, right, or a response to our justice system, the words kindness and respect don't show up a lot, do they? Like, you don't. Like, if you've been to court. I don't know if you've all visited court yet. Yeah? Okay, if you haven't, what you'll know is when you go to court, when the judge comes in, everyone stands up. When the judge leaves, everybody leaves. When, I go, when I'm in court, I have a special duty. When I leave the room, I have to bow. Which I, hey, anyway, I kind of go like that or whatever. <laughs> so there is respect, but respect is only owed one way. Respect is owed to the judge. There is no respect owed to anybody else. And you will, if you have a chance to do some court visits, you will see how that plays out. So the reason it took me so long to get kindness and respect is because when I started thinking about law, I didn't think about kindness and respect because that's not what we know from our legal system. And this, this kept happening over and over again in the, in the two and a half days we were there. Um, I would just keep, you know, um, what sort of decisions should the, the, the council make? Like, how do we, I want another question, I said. How do we pick people who should come into the program? Again, this, I'm being the very practical person. We're going to have, we're starting the program. We're going to start it slowly. There are way too many Indigenous people involved in the criminal justice system. I mean, this was, this was 91. We didn't have the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. We didn't have all those studies, but we already knew, everybody knew. The justice system wasn't working for indigenous people. So we're going to, all these people, because there are more indigenous people in Toronto than in any other place in Ontario. We're going to have all these people who could be, get into the program. How do we pick people? Which is a very, I think, realistic question. I was very proud of myself for thinking of this question. It was a very good question, right? We have all these people wanting to come in. How do we pick people? And I got looked at, I got used to the look. <laughs> they didn't quite go that far, but I got the equivalent of the high roll. And they said, look, who are you to look in the heart of an individual and know whether when they're treated with kindness and respect, how they will respond? You can't know that. All you can know is that the people you're working with have criminal records but that's a statement about how a system that we know doesn't work has failed them. So you can't know. So don't. Don't try and pick people. Now, that's the, and so we don't in our program. Now, other programs, and it's important, other programs that exist do some screening. And it's not because they're wrong. It's because in, you know, there's not one indigenous approach to everything, right? And so different communities will have different responses based on the needs of those communities. So I am not at all suggesting, and don't take away, that this is the way to do things. There is no one way to do things. There's no pan-Indigenous way to do things. But this is the advice we got. And so, and we, and we, we, we followed that. What sort of decisions should we give people, I asked. What sort of decisions should we give people? Because again, you know, we come from a system where we believe that Punishments has to be sense of parity, right? So if one person, if two people do the same thing, then we sort of want them to be treated, they should be dealt with the same way. And they said, again, that's kind of stupid. They didn't say that. They're much too nice to say that's kind of stupid. But they said, you know, what you have to do is you have to work with people, find out what matters to them, and give them something they can do. They said, the people you work with are all used to failure. Failure is what is expected of them. That's why they're involved in the criminal justice system. Failure is what's expected of them. So you have to give them something they can do. So that if they come back again, and they will, many of them, 
So none of this one chance is your one chance. When they come back again, they will come back feeling two things that are really important. They will come back feeling, I can do things, which is not a feeling they would have had because they would not, will not have experienced that probably in their life. And they'll also come back feeling a bit ashamed that they're back, which will be good to help the discussion about what needs to happen next. But you don't set people up to fail. Setting people up to fail doesn't do anybody any good. That's not going to change anything. And there are all sorts of things that I, that I learned from this. We have a little uh, on our website, aboriginallegal.ca, on the community council link, um, there's a summary of the Birch Island discussion, and, and you, you take a look at it. I'm happy to talk about it later, as you, I may come back to it. But what, what really struck me as I, thought about, as, as I thought about what I heard over the course of two and a half days was that, you know, I had I'd been to law school. It had now been 10 years since I, more than 10 years since I'd been to law school. I sort of thought, okay, I'm... I'm past that whole law school thing. I've got a broader perspective on the world. I haven't been hung up on being a law. And I realized, you know, what that means is I could maybe turn my head two or three degrees either way. But I couldn't get any further than that. I have no idea. I had no idea what justice meant. No idea what justice meant. I know what law meant. And I know what law, what the hallmarks of law are. And there's a reason we have that. I mean, we have a legal system here for a reason, because if you screw up, you go to jail. Like in this system, we have to have all these rules because when you screw up and break the law, you go to jail. And that's an ugly, ugly place. And generally as a society, we don't care about people when they go to jail. Like they go and we just turn our backs to them. So we need to have all these rules. We need to say it's better than one, how many, certain number, how, whatever number of guilty people go free, they want an innocent person go to jail. We need to do all that, right? We need to do all that in this justice system, in this legal system. But that's not what justice means, and that's not what a justice system needs to be. What we do in our legal system, and again, is, you know, it's the one we have, we take two concepts that need not be linked, and we link them. The two concepts are responsibility and punishment. We link them. If you're responsible, we will punish you, right? This is why we are all so reluctant to take responsibility for things, right? Have you ever had these discussions with someone where they, someone says something really, really stupid, sexist, racist, or whatever, and you talk to them about it, and then they deny that, well, no, that's not really racist, that's not really sexist. Why are you even denying this? Partly it's because we're afraid. We've been taught, you, you know, if I say I'm wrong, then I'm going to be punished. One personal story. When I was a kid, I used to play with my, uh, my brother and I had a, we, we had a, we were, we were in the basement. We had two beds in the basement. My parents were upstairs with my younger brother. And we had two beds. And they were, you could play, you bounce on the beds. And these the beds that if you bounce on them enough, the bed kind of separated and crashed to the ground. It didn't break, break, like you could put it back together, I guess. <laughs> I never did. Um, and my dad, at the time, was going through some very stressful things that I had no idea about, because I was a kid and my world was me. Um, now I've expanded it to me and maybe one other person. So, um, and my dad was raised with a fair amount of discipline and threats of discipline. So my dad would spank us. And he's, he, he's apologized, he apologized for this all the time. Um, he was really, but he did, and he was a big guy. Well, I was a kid, but he was a big guy. And so we would bounce on the beds, and we'd be playing, and then the bed would fall, and, cra and it would be crash, boom, it would crash. And then, and because we're in the basement, then we would hear, my father going to the stairs, then we'd hear the door open, and then we hear my father going down the stairs, and we're freaking out, right? We're freaking out because my dad's going to spank us. 
And he never really heard, but it's a scary thing. So we started screaming, like literally screaming. As soon as we heard this, no, Dad, no, it's an accident. We were just, we're sitting there. I don't know what happened, please. And we were doing all this. The, 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 the mic's going to the red. The sound's all gone now. <laughs> Probably broken everything. Um, you know, don't hit us, don't hit us. And my dad would run in and we would still keep pleading with him. So what do we, what, what do, we do? I'm lying to my father. I'm lying to my father. I don't want to lie to my father. It's not something I would normally do, but I'm lying to my father. Why am I doing that? Because punishment and responsibility are twin. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that's one of the messages that the elders and teachers gave us. You don't have to twin punishment and responsibility. And in fact, and this is the his historically in most indigenous societies, there wasn't punishment. People would take responsibility because when you took responsibility, you would be taught about what the proper way to do things were. So there wasn't a reason to deny responsibility. Um, I was very fortunate uh, that I helped with Professor Michael Jackson at UBC. We helped write the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples report on justice called Bridging the Cultural Divide. And when we were writing that, we were looking at pre-contact uh, or post-contact uh, indigenous societies and justice systems. And it's really hard to find examples of trials in indigenous societies. It's not impossible, but it's hard to find. And part of it is because there's not a reason to deny responsibility, because we don't, because we don't tie, because you don't have to tie punishment and responsibility together. But again, these are things that, until I had a chance to spend time with elders, and I never questioned that. Why would I question that? That's what we all are raised to believe. And so, so that experience was really important. And now we have the, the community council program, and it's been functioning since 92, and it's the largest urban indigenous justice program in Canada. And it makes a real difference. We take people out of the criminal justice system who have often long records, and we start to work with them, and their lives start to change. Their lives start to change because they're prepared to start to change their lives. Their lives start to change because they sit in a room with other Indigenous people who understand their lives, who understand, who can, you know, if they say, someone says, yeah, you know, my son, my dad killed my mother, someone, one of our volunteers will probably say, yeah, I know what happened to me, what happened to my cousin. I mean, the experiences people have that, that people think are just unique to them, there are people in the room who look like them, who've been through what they've been through, and who are, can say, it doesn't have to be this way. Again, you don't have to live to the expectation of failure that everybody else has for you. And so our program makes a real difference. It does make a difference for everybody. Some people don't make it. But it does make a difference. I'm here today. And I'm missing a funeral for someone who didn't make it. So that's the other part of this. So when I say, and I do say, that our program is about saving lives, I'm not making it up. But we're not saving the lives. People have to want to save their own life. They have to want to start that. But you have to give them opportunities. And this is an opportunity. We give people opportunities for that. We had another program I want to talk a bit about, which we started about 10 years ago. It was dealing with indigenous people involved in the child welfare system. Child welfare system is, as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has said, the new residential schools for kids. Prison is the new residential school for adults. But for kids, child welfare is a new residential school. You probably know this, but there are more Indigenous kids in care at the moment in Canada than were ever in residential schools at any one time. 50% of the kids in care in this country are Indigenous. In some provinces, the criteria it appears for involved in the, criminal, in the child welfare system is number one, are you Indigenous? So this is, and it's a horrendous cycle, and it is a cycle. And I'm not going to go into the whole history of it because I don't have time. So we thought maybe we can take some of the lessons we learned from the criminal justice process and use it in child welfare. And so about 10 years ago, we started our 
what we initially called the Child Welfare Community Council. And it was working okay, but it wasn't okay, but not great. And then uh, one of the staff people, the guy who was running the program, said, you know, we should get a name for the program. We should get a name for the program. And what that means is we should go to an elder or a teacher and ask him for a name. And if we get a name in the language, then maybe that will help us set our direction. And I went, okay. Again, my, you know, why not? So uh, Ryan approached uh, Jake Agone, who's a, an elder and traditional teacher, told him about the program and said, we want a name. Jake thought about it and he came to, to our office and he burned some, we gave him medicines, we gave him tobacco and he burned some medicines and he thought about it and then he said, the name of your program is Giwade Nanang. And that means North Star. And I had no idea why he chose that name. I went, okay, that's good. And partly that's because, again, as I'm starting to realize, you know, when you get a name, that means you have more work to do. You have to figure out, why do I have this name? What and he was very helpful. But it, but it, the, the, it really helped us. So Giwe Nanang, as you all know, uh, is Ojibwe for North Star. So again, oh great, now I know it means North Star. I still don't get it. Like what? So when Indigenous people, everyone, but Indigenous people, were lost or are lost if they're in the woods and they're lost and you want to get out and your phone doesn't work and the GPS doesn't help you, you look up in the sky and you see the North Star. And if you see the North Star, that tells you how to get out. But what's really important about the name, so that was really helpful. That was really helpful. Okay, that's what we're here to do. We're to help people get out of this system, not just, not just Indigenous families and their children, but children's aid societies as well. But there's another part to that, that again, I'm, that I'm just starting to, you know, you're still trying to figure out. You have to want to get out. Some people don't want to get out. Some people don't. I don't know why but they don't want to get out. And you know, the person whose funeral is for, I, I don't know why, I knew him well, but I, he didn't want to get out and he was killed. So you have to want to get out. No one can make you get out. You have to want to get out. And you have to figure out if you're helping people, how you can make it as possible as you can so that they will want to get out. But ultimately it has to be their decision. And so once we had the name, that gave us a purpose and helped us. And the program has really expanded and done really, really great things after we got the name because that's what mattered. So that helped give us direction because the elders and the teachers have direction. The organization, Aboriginal Legal Services, that's our English name. We used to be called Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto. It's not hard to change that name. You just file a form. So we used to call the Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, but now we have offices across uh, southern Ontario and the near north. So it's kind of weird to be like, hi, Aboriginal Legal Services of Toronto, Windsor branch. Like, plus, basically, unless you're in Toronto, having Toronto in your name is not a good thing, right? Because everybody hates Toronto. And so why would you want to say, hi, I'm Aboriginal Legal Services of Sudbury. I hate Toronto. Yeah, okay. That's, <laughs> But I'm not really, so why start that? So we changed our name, our English name. Again, not hard to do, you fill out forms, that's it. But, oh God, 15 years ago or more, we went to, we decided we wanted to get, now, sometimes people say, I want to get an indigenous name, but there's no such thing as an indigenous name because there's no such thing as an indigenous language, right? Like the names are specific. And John will know this more than me, so and I'm just scratching the surface of this. But like, I asked one of our, our traditional teacher, what, is there an indigenous, is there a word for indigenous in your language? And she said, no. Nope. Like indigenous is a word we use to apply to a group of people who share things in common, but we apply to other people to give you a name. That's not what they use. The word Anishinaabe 
means the people. The word Inuit means the people. Most people's words for who they are means the people. So indigenous is this word that externally we impose on a large group of people because they have some commonalities, at least according to people externally, and so we pick it. So we don't have an indigenous name. You can't have an indigenous name. I don't think there's an indigenous Esperanto, is there? No? Okay. Are you working on it? No. No, I didn't think so. I think that would be wrong, but I, I don't know. But um, So we have an Anishinaabemowin, Anishinaabemowin name. Ojibwe, it's easier for me to say. Mm -hmm. And we went to Elder Jackie Lavalley, and we gave Jackie Lavalley tobacco because that's the way here you do things. Again, you do things, you, you do things differently in different places. But here, if you go to Jackie, you give her tobacco. And she thought about it, and she gave us a name. And the name she gave us was Gakinagwai Wabama de Boywin, which translates as all those who seek the truth. And again, it's something we have to think about. It's not who speak the truth, it's who seek the truth. What does that say? It doesn't say we have the truth. It says our job is to help people find the truth as much as that truth they can figure out applies to them, whether it be our clients, whether it be the courts or whatever. So, so that's, what, that's, what, that's what we do and that help, that's I think helped the agency as well. So I've been really lucky. I've shared, I, I've shared a bunch, number of experiences that I've had. I've been really lucky. I think I have like the best job in the world because I get to work at Aboriginal Legal Services. And it's just like a really cool place. I also get to go to court, which is also neat. Like, like, like it's fun. I like going to court. I like arguing things with judges. It's, it uses a different part of the brain. Um, it's not intellectual. I mean, it's in, intellectually interesting in a narrow way, but it's fun. And as, as Amanda says, it makes a shitty system slightly less shitty for some people. It's a, can be a, it's a frustrating place to work in. The really interesting, the really interesting, important work that we do is with the community council and Giwade and Nung and all. That's where the really important stuff is. But we have to do this work as well because there are people who, who are in, in the justice system around in, all across Canada. And we have to do what we can do. But. I want to take a few minutes to talk about sort of how, like, like I have this job, you can't have it. So, like, so what's what he? So thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> so what what do you take? So what I say in terms of what you take away and what I think some of the lessons. Whatever law you're going to do, it will probably have some involvement with Indigenous people. If you do criminal law, it will undoubtedly have involvement with Indigenous people, whether you're a Crown or your defense counsel. And if you don't think it does, then you're simply wrong. So I still run into lawyers, so yeah, I don't have many Indigenous clients. That's kind of weird. Um, so if you do criminal law, but if you do civil law, civil litigation, there's more and more Indigenous issues being fought out through civil litigation. There are, there are, there are like, we, don't even, we haven't begun to start the class actions. Like we've only, like we finished the residential school class action, now there's a day school class action, the day scholar class action, and now there's a class action against a lawyer who represented people in the residential school class action because he ripped off people in the residential school class action representing them. So there's class, so there'll be lots of litigation. There'll be lots of it. It's unfortunate, but there'll be lots of it. It is, it is horrendous that one of the results of the residential school class action is finding yet another way to treat Indigenous people badly, but lawyers are good at that. The Law Society of Upper Canada recently embarked upon a, an attempt to disciplining a lawyer that ended up tra traumatizing, re-traumatizing many Indigenous people in Northern Ontario. So you might you do you could do you could work professional discipline, it could be professional discipline at the law society or somewhere else. You'll be you'll have indigenous people there. Tax law, human rights law, uh, whatever other kinds of law there are. Intellectual intellectual property is a huge area. You know the question of how you take how do you think about intellectual property for people whose property was never owned individually. 
How do we do that? How do you protect people if someone comes in, if someone wants to do a song? I hear a song at a ceremony, I tape it, then I turn it in to a song that I write, and then I copyright it, and then it's my song, and anyone who uses it has to pay me. How do we do that? How do we think about copyright? Because it has a time period. So intellectual property, there's a whole bunch of stuff around that. Intellectual property has all, you know, you name me an area of law and I will come up with an, an indigenous aspect to it. Real estate, huge issues around indigenous rights and all sorts of stuff. But what that means is you need to think about what you're going to do when you have those sort of cases. It's not enough to go, yeah, yeah, well, it doesn't really matter. You need to think about how you're going to work with Indigenous people. Whatever side you're on, it doesn't matter if you're on the side of Indigenous people or not. I mean, probably not. Anyway, it doesn't matter for you. I mean, you make the choices you make, and that's, you just do what you want to do, and that's, that's good. But you do need to treat people respectfully. And I, say this, and I say this because we don't do that much. Like, I was just in, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be up in a Kaluit uh, a couple weeks ago, arguing a case in front of the Nunavut Court of Appeal, which is the Alberta Court of Appeal dressed differently. But, and it was a case about a mandatory minimum sentence, and one of the issues was around IQ. IQ does not mean, which I did not know, the IQ does not mean IQ as we know it, intel whatever intelligence quotient or whatever. IQ is an Inuit concept of the way in which laws need to be applied, what, what behavior needs to be dealt with, then those principles apply, according to the government of Nunavut, in all areas of the territory. And the question was, does, how does IQ apply to law? But IQ is, a, is, is the English two letters because no one wants to learn how to say the big, long Inuit word is Inuit Chauyimayachtuchanit. But I can't go up there. I could go up there. I could have gone up there and done my whole submission to the court saying IQ. Because the judges wouldn't know, the lawyers wouldn't know, like none of us are Inuit. But I can't do that because that's disrespectful. I can't do that because the message I send if I do that is I can't be bothered to learn how to speak something that is so crucial to you. And I, we see this in court. You see this with, with individual uh, accused or appellants or respondents, and people can't pronounce their name. So they kind of say, oh, it's too funny. I've, I've actually had court cases where we've had fights about how to pronounce someone's name, where defense counsel says, my client's name is X, and the Crown says, no, it's pronounced Y. And says, so, well, I was talking to him, and that's his name. Like, do we, we don't really need to fight about this, do we? But, or people, or, their, or the community they're from. Many uh, communities are going back to their indigenous names. And you see people go, yeah, yeah, I used to be called something. It used to be, we used to be able to pronounce it, and now it's like Mishka Gogaming. So again, we had a case for it. And I can't say that. So you need, but that's just, like, incredibly disrespectful. Right? I mean, it's just incredibly disrespectful. So you need to think about that. I have judges, I, whenever I go to a judge's conference, I, someone will take me aside and say, so is it like Aboriginal, Indigenous? Like, what, what, what word do I use? And people, I, would used to, I used to get, not as much, I would get calls from crowds. Go, I can probably ask Jonathan, because like he's not indigenous, so he won't think I'm really an ass. And I'll ask him how I should go talk to an indigenous person, because then I won't make a fool of myself. So this is like my role is to be like the non-indigenous court person whisperer or something. So um, I have a whole stage show. It's great. Um, and it's really, it's not hard. Like, it's really not hard. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is to say to someone, what term would you like me to apply? Maybe they don't want Indigenous or Aboriginal law. If you go to Six Nations, they ain't going to want to be told they're Aboriginal or Indigenous. 
I go to Six Nations, say, I'm with Aboriginal Legal Services. We're not Aboriginal, we're Haudenosaunee. I know, I know, I know. Like, I know, we're, but we're called Aboriginal Legal Services. I'm not making a judgment about you, that's just what we're called. But, but ask. How hard is that? Ask. Some people, maybe one, like Harry Laform. He hates the word indigenous. Harry Laform would rather be called native. He'd rather be called Harry Laform. But, <laughs> but ask people. Like, don't beat around, but what should I say? Ask. Don't assume. Ask. I mentioned that when we, um, when we asked Jackie Lavalle for something, we gave her tobacco. And I was recently in a case, again, up in, in northern Ontario in Pekanchikum, and there was a discussion with the judge and the chief, and the judge said, you know, I want to, to talk to the elders. And the chief said, it would be great if you would talk to the elders. And the judge said, okay, well, I'll come and bring tobacco. And the chief said, we don't do that here, which was a nice discussion. And I'm glad the chief felt comfortable enough to tell him that. But you can't assume because something happens here, it happens there. So all you have to do is ask. But to say all you have to do is ask makes it sound like it's easy. It's somehow very hard for lawyers to ask. We somehow seem to think we have to know all the answers. We have to know everything. And to ask someone a question is somehow to be a sign of weakness on our part. And so we just plow ahead without stopping. So, so first thing is, if you don't know, ask. Ask nicely, ask respectfully, and you will probably be treated well. Sometimes people will yell at you, but so what? You'll get used to it. Judges yell at you all the time. Uh, and you don't yell, well, you don't yell back, generally. You can raise your voice a bit, but don't yell back. Um, so ask. It's okay. The other thing to keep in mind when you're working with Indigenous people, or whether they're on the other side or whatever, is you are not going to be the first lawyer they've ever seen. And pretty much, if people have experience with the legal system, it will be a bad experience. And Indigenous people in front of the courts, uh, you know, from a number of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system, everybody's on one side. Like defense counsel, crown judge, they're all on the same side. And that's not because those people are not sophisticated. It's because they're very sophisticated. It's because on, based on their lived experience, everybody else is on one side. So keep that in mind. You're not the first lawyer they will have met. And you're not going to fix everything. And people who have different perspectives aren't making it up. Uh, I, I, was, I was in Timmins a few years ago, visiting the Shania Twain Museum, which has since closed down. I wasn't visiting the Shania Twain Museum. I was, but you can't now. I'm sorry. They've closed it up. But I was in Timmins for a, for a, a, a talk or something. And at the end of the talk, a police officer came to see me, and he, and he was a young man, and he said, you know, there's a number of First Nations around Timmins, and he said, you know, I, I don't know what's happening. Like, I go into these communities, and I want to help. Like, people, like, there are women being beaten up, and I want to deal with this. And I go in, and whenever I go into the houses, people look at me, and they're angry, and they're not, they don't want to cooperate, and they hate me. And he said, I don't hate people. I don't have any stereotypes about these people. I grew up in Mississauga, without getting a discussion of the name. Anyway, he grew up in Mississauga, and he didn't know any indigenous people. And he said, I don't know why people hate me, and I, and I, and I want to help. And I just, I, this is really bothering me. And all I could say to him was, you know, you're not the first police officer people have seen. You can't expect that somehow people are going to go, oh, right. Like, you're the good police officer. How would they know that? So the people you will work with, generally, who are involved in the justice system, who are indigenous, will have been screwed by that system. They or their families or their nations, they will have been screwed by the system. So you're coming, you may come to help, you may come to not help. But that's the perspective people are going to take. And it's not because they don't know how the legal system works. It's because they know only too well how the legal system works. But the way they know how the legal system works and the way you know how the legal system works are different. Not saying your version is wrong. 
but their version isn't wrong either. So you need to keep that in mind. You need, you're gonna it's gonna take more time. If you wanna do this right, it's gonna take more time because you're gonna have to listen more. You're gonna have to ask more questions. And if you don't wanna do that, like that's fine. Just don't work with indigenous people. Don't work on files with indigenous people. Like that's okay. No one, not everyone has to do it. So just like, don't do it. But if you're not prepared to put the time in, then you're not gonna get the results. Because what, at the end of the day, what people want is to be what everyone wants. They want to be heard, they want to be treated fairly, they want to be, feel they were listened to. The history of the legal system, that Western legal system in Canada, is one that doesn't happen. That is not the history. This book is, this book is full of examples of where people don't listen. And so you need to take the time. And if you do, you know, you will start. And again, it's not going to be some magic epiphany where someone goes, oh, thank God, now I trust the legal system. No. I mean, it's one of the interesting things. We have the Gladue courts in, uh, in Toronto. And there are other indigenous-specific courts in, in the province. And what studies and evaluations have shown is that indigenous people trust that court. They don't trust the courts. We have people who will be arrested on a Monday and would rather stay in custody till Thursday for a bail hearing. We don't want them to, but they want, because they, are, they feel that maybe when they go to a Gladue court, they'll get a chance, a fair chance. Even if they're detained, at least they feel that they will have had a fair chance because they don't expect they will have had a fair chance. We have clients who have really long records who have never had a bail hearing and never had a trial, ever. Because all their lawyer does is tell them to consent to your detention and plead guilty. And that's what they do. So that's, and that's a real experience. And so again, that's what you need when you're doing this work, if you're doing this work. And again, most of you will at some point in your careers be doing this work, whether you want to or not. You need to take the time. Don't think you're gonna change the world. You're just gonna maybe change someone's thought that maybe the system could work. Crowns who prosecute indigenous people, they're not hated as long as you're respectful and you treat people well. People understand, nobody, people understand the need to deal with people with wrongdoers, that's not an issue. But you have to be, do it respectfully. And so often it's not done respectfully. And if you do that, it makes a difference. And when you get the opportunity to actually take any opportunity you can get to go out in communities, go to meet the, go to the friendship centers where there are gatherings of elders. You can go, like everybody's welcome at these things. You can go, learn. It helps, it helps, we, really, law school is such a narrowing experience. It's, it's, it's really bad for that. And so if you get any chance to, to shake yourself up, that's really, it's good for you. It's good for your soul, it's good for everything. And it's good, it makes you question things and it's important to question things. So take all those opportunities. Now I'd like to give you the opportunity. What a segue. Wow, how does he do it? Any questions? Yes, thank you. It's on our website. Perfect. So in moving forward, should we be referring to um, Aboriginal Legal Services as well as Indigenous? Whatever name you want to refer, but people know us as Aboriginal Legal Services. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point. That's, so when we go to the court, like when we, we always have the, whenever we go to the Supreme Court, they have to, um, they always send us back a letter. What's your French name? We don't, and we have to sign a form saying we don't have a French name. But the only name they recognize is Aboriginal Legal Services. That's our legal name. Because our, our, we're not going to, our Indigenous name, we're not going to put through the legal system to register. So we haven't trademarked it. Don't steal it. We haven't trademarked it. It's, so Aboriginal Legal Services is fine. But, yep. Yeah, yeah.
discussion was um, that indigenous communities kind of feel negatively towards the justice system. Do you notice any like differences between communities, whether like rural or um, urban, and how like they feel towards the justice system, or even just like the series between like Vancouver and BC versus here? So I think it really much depends on the community. I think there are some of the in in Ontario. We have some of the northern communities where the courts fly in and then fly out. I mean, you can only have contempt for a system that does that. And I, and I don't mean the people who do it really try hard. I know the judges, I know. But you know, if you're going into a community, like if you go in northern Ontario, you fly into communities, the flying courts, you fly in and you stay as long as the pilot says you can stay. And when the pilot says you have to go, if it's early, you shut down court and you leave. Like the message is pretty clear. We are not staying here under any circumstances. So, you know, what message does that send? Um, so I think it depends on the communities. Um, where I know that in, in BC, for example, there are a number of First Nations courts that have built up. And a lot of those courts were created because the First Nations wanted those courts. So I think those nations feel much closer to the justice system and feel that they've been listened to. So, but, you know, it's really very, very specific. And, and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is even within, like we talk about indigenous communities as though they are monolithic, but of course they're not. So even within communities, people will have different, different opinions. Um, so I think you just need to look at it on a case by case basis and try and maybe figure out why people feel the way they do. Because the other thing is history, you know, we have a weird, we have very little sense of history. If you're non-Indigenous, we have a, our sense of history of Canada sort of starts when our, when our, when our, whoever our came here first, that's sort of where our history goes. Uh, John wrote this great article, here's your seminal article about the Royal Proclamation. You know, the Royal Proclamation of 1763 is a big deal for Indigenous people and most non-Indigenous people blank, so 1763, for God's sakes. It was like 350 years ago. Who the heck even knows? Because if you're not from here, 350 years ago here is a long time ago. If you're here 10,000 years, it's not very long. We don't have trouble with time back where we're from, but we have trouble with time here. So part of the issue is there are events, the, ha the hanging of the Caribou Chilcotin chiefs in the 1800s, that had an impact in the Chilcotin part of BC until recently, I'm still May, but until recently when the government's apologized for it. Uh, in Northern Ontario, there was the, uh, is a book called Killing, of the, Killing the Shaman, which is an interesting, fascinating story about uh, what's happened when people tried to impose the justice system up in Northern Ontario. So there are, there are historical reasons people will feel the way they do that will vary from community to community. Is that responsive? It's kind of a long answer, but. Uh, other questions? Yes. I, I don't think I know entirely how to phrase this, but this is so, kind of something that's in the back of my head. Is that as somebody who isn't an Indigenous person going into work in these communities or wanting to do something, are, is there sort of like a limit on sort of what you should be doing or where you should be going? Or you kind of get. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a very good question. It's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, so there's a term that often that a lot of indigenous organizations use that I feel I'm, I'm conflicted about, which is the term technician. I don't know that I like it, but lawyers are often referred to as technicians because it's like you have a skill. I mean, I do think law school really is an over, it's a big kind of trade school. So I, you know, we're learning a little trade and it's kind of like plumbing, law school, whatever. Like, I'm really bad with my hands. So I went to law school as my trade school. So I think the big thing like I've never, well, not never, but I've, I've never had a lot of problems at Aboriginal Legal Services, but then I'm not trying to tell people what to do. So where, where, where it's a problem is when you start moving outside of, when you start thinking you know everything. In fact, you should start by thinking you know nothing. What you have, you, what you have is a skill set that people want, and that's, what they're, and that's what they want. They don't want anything else, necessarily and if they want they will ask if they're not asking for it you don't have to volunteer it so i think and so being humble again 
I'm not saying you're not, can't be humble, but being humble is not an easy thing for lawyers to be. It isn't. And you carry with it. Again, people will think, oh, you're a lawyer, you're just really, and maybe you're not, but there's a reputation that, that we have. Um, so yeah, it's going and saying, I'm here to do this one thing, and keep asking. Keep asking people how things are going, ask for advice. If you're not sure about something, ask. So as long as you do that, people are, people generally, you know, if you are bothered, if you, you're bothering to, to, to say, look, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And, and again, just learn, each community you work in will be different. You know, there are communities that are, I don't like to divide, so there's one way to divide communities and I, I don't like to do it. You know, there, there are communities that are predominantly Christian, there are communities that are predominantly traditional. Some of those communities are not always the most tolerant of each other, of the differences, some are fine. You need to know these things. So, so listen, look, ask questions before you start to wander into areas. That, and also, don't, it's really good to say you're sorry. Like, if you screw up, because you will. Like, we're, none of us are perfect. I mean, if I didn't have I'm sorry in my vocabulary, I'd be in a lot of trouble. So there's nothing wrong with saying I made a mistake. 